Wednesday afternoon. Absolute, undiluted hell. The last few hours for David Jenkins have consisted of nothing but pain and disbelief. An anonymous email had stated that his beloved wife of six years, Lauren, had been seen entering a cheap motel room the previous Wednesday afternoon, and that she was now having dinner with the same man again. To say David was shocked would be a gross understatement. He and Lauren were deeply in love, had sex three to five times a week, and their lovemaking was usually intense and sincere. He was not yet 30, and he thought their lovemaking was vigorous and enjoyable for each of them. Still, he couldn't ignore the email or its implications. So, feeling as stressed and strung out as he had never been in his life, he drove home that day already a changed man. Arriving home around 6 p.m., as usual, he saw Lauren's car already in the driveway. Still in her work clothes, she was standing at the sink rinsing vegetables when he walked into the kitchen, hesitantly said hello, and set down his briefcase. Hey, sweetie, how was your day? Lauren wiped her hands with a towel before turning to kiss him. David was amazed at how carefree Lauren was after spending the day with another man. Great, but there was some bad news this afternoon related to a project we're working on, and it looks like I have to go to Greensboro on Friday, so I won't be home until 8 p.m. at the earliest, depending on how the meetings go, and then just drive home. David knew Lauren's work schedule pretty well, and he knew that schedule was most flexible on Wednesday and Friday afternoons, so his first thought on checking the charges in this email was to make it even easier for Lauren on the upcoming Friday. The project crisis, the meeting, and the business trip were all lies, and instead he'd arranged to take Friday off to do some preliminary work and look after the motel for Lauren and her lover. Well, at least you don't have to stay overnight and we'll still spend the whole weekend together, Lauren suggested. Since you can't really predict when you'll be home, could you give me a call when you leave Greensboro? I'll try my best to get ready for dinner. David thought for a moment. Yesterday he wouldn't have noticed or even considered how considerate Lauren had been in trying to make dinner together possible despite his unplanned business trip. Now he wondered if she'd asked him to give her a two-hour period to close her legs and remove the traces of his lover from her traitorous, slutty body. Of course, I'll call you when I have a better idea of when I can leave Greensboro, and I'll also call you from the road when I realize what time I'll be home. Is that okay? Since the point of Friday was now to make it easier for Lauren to cheat again, if it really was her at the motel, and if that email was accurate, David wanted Lauren to feel comfortable knowing that he wouldn't have a chance to catch her. David, I'm going to make dinner, and then I'm going to take a quick shower. Could you keep an eye on that skillet while I'm gone? Make sure the vegetables don't burn, Lauren asked, picking up her purse and carrying it upstairs. Of course, dear, don't worry, David replied, meanwhile thinking to himself, strange, I thought she usually left her purse downstairs. The shower itself also got him thinking. While not uncommon, she didn't usually shower immediately upon returning home, so as he looked through his mail and stirred the vegetables, he nervously pondered whether the random shower was related to the news in the email he'd received earlier. To hell with my life, David thought. One anonymous email and I'm questioning everything about my marriage that until today I thought was absolutely wonderful. At dinner, David was visibly thoughtful. Is there anything else wrong, honey? Besides the project you were talking about, you seem awfully quiet and almost on another planet, Lauren finally asked getting a curt answer to a couple of questions she'd been asking. No, I'm sorry. I guess I'm just tired and also already thinking about what I need to do tomorrow to be ready to head to Greensboro on Friday. David realized that he needed to act normal so as not to make Lauren think that something was out of the ordinary. David found it almost funny. What would be considered normal now? My wife could be cheating on me, or I could be pranked by someone with a shitty sense of humor, or I could be the unintended victim of a wrong email address. What if it was a completely different woman and the sender mistook her for my wife? To hell with that kind of life. Yesterday I was sure of my happiness, and today I'm a fucking wreck of doubt. Dinner was cleaned up, and after watching a little TV, David and Lauren talked about their plans for the weekend, and finally started getting ready for bed. David had already said he was going to bed early since he had to go to work early to get ready for his trip. 
David's stomach twisted in a knot at the thought of what he would do if Lauren made any moves on sex tonight. He thought about Wednesday nights, and whether there had been a pattern to their sex lately, and realized with horror that, from his recollection, it had been about fifty. Fifty. Tying that in with her shower after work, he felt like he was in the dark, trying to pin the tail on a two-faced donkey. Lauren got into bed first, and when David joined her, she quickly snuggled up behind him, hugged him tightly, and reached up to scratch his chest with her fingernails. Can I take your mind off work for 30 minutes, love? Lauren playfully offered. Shit, David thought. How much more can I take before I lose my temper? He patiently stuck to plan A and said, As much as I'd like to, dear, I won't do you much good today or tomorrow. I'm just too distracted by this project hanging over me. Saying this, he again couldn't believe how much his life had changed in the 60 seconds it took to read and understand this simple email he had received just 10 hours ago. It's okay, honey. I understand. I just thought if you were ready for it, I'd offer you some well-deserved stress relief. Lauren hugged David tightly and kissed the back of his neck before saying goodnight and rolling over to the other side. David was relieved, and at the same time, what did she mean by, if you're up for it, to hell with my life? David got up and left for work before Lauren woke up, so he dodged any further questions or penetrating looks. He realized how poorly he was handling the problem, real or imagined. Last night had reminded him of Poe's traitor's heart, and after realizing that, he knew he had to avoid another night of close contact with Lauren. Hey, honey, I'm going to be working late tonight getting ready for tomorrow's trip and meetings, so don't worry about dinner for me and I'll see you probably before bed. David left in her voicemail around noon. And a Thursday, however, was spent without preparing for business meetings. David was a planner and organizer by nature and profession, so while he had no hard facts about her infidelity, he wanted to organize everything. He called around until he found a lawyer who could meet with him the next day and searched the internet for recording devices. After deciding what he wanted to buy, he looked around town for any local stores with similar devices and found a store he would stop by before heading home. David is competent enough in his actual job that no one would ask him what was going on, but his heart and mind were clearly elsewhere. He got off work a little late and then went into a store with eavesdropping equipment and bought a simple voice-activated pen that he thought he could hide in Lauren's purse, which he usually had with her in her office and in her car. He also brought the work home to pretend to get ready for the next day's trip before Lauren went to bed. Hi, sweetie. I'm so glad you're finally home, Lauren said as she walked to the door when David arrived around 9 p.m. How's the project and the trip going? Pretty good, I think. We've put more resources into it since we found out about these new problems, so I'm hoping it'll be resolved on Friday, for better or worse. This is playing with fire, David reflected. For better or worse? I wonder if she feels the same way now. Thursday night, to David's relief, was a repeat of the previous night, only with hugs. To her credit, Lauren seemed completely unfazed, and, as far as David could tell, behaved towards him in the same way she had before. Conventionally speaking, however, he was such a complete wreck that Lauren probably had no trouble appearing normal compared to David. On Friday, rising again at dawn, David checked his pen, put it in Lauren's purse, and left the house. He killed some time at a coffee shop and then headed out to meet with his lawyer at 10 a.m. David considered this meeting purely for information, but he ended up really liking the lawyer. They discussed David's email and his still unconfirmed concerns, as well as the fact that today was a date with a potential lover that David was going to check out for himself. He recognized that he had nothing but the damning email, so going wah-wah on a private investigator or thousands of dollars of electronic surveillance equipment didn't make much sense. From his lawyer, David learned the shambolic reality of divorce, if anything. Without children, a no-fault divorce was relatively easy, especially since David and Lauren made comparable salaries and had similar retirement plan balances. The house was mostly in debt, so liquidating it would have been more of an emotional upheaval than a financial strain. However, David left the law office in complete disarray. How can I even feel this nightmare and think it won't be so bad? We were supposed to be together forever until death do us part.
David spent his lunch hour at Starbucks surfing the internet and continuing to research the procedure for what is called divorce. Websites abounded with information on how to detect a cheating spouse, as well as how to avoid detection when cheating, how to hide income, as well as how to find it. The most enlightening sites were those on why spouses cheat. Nothing David read touched on Lauren's motivation. That fact alone was probably the reason David hoped deep down that it was all a mistake. Lauren couldn't cheat on him. They were too close, too much in love, too in sync with each other for that to be true. When he could no longer broach the subject of cheating, he packed up and left, heading for the motel. Time stretched slowly, or so it seemed to David. As he drove to the motel mentioned in that damning email, he realized that if the whole affair story was indeed true, then it was entirely possible that Lauren didn't always use the same motel. If it was true, then the whole day today might have been for nothing, and he still wouldn't know anything for sure. The pen he'd put in her purse might eventually bear some fruit, but David knew he couldn't take any more of this uncertainty about the state and future of his marriage. Pulling into the motel parking lot at 1.40 p.m., he drove around until he found a remote parking spot that overlooked most of the rooms and the office. Now he would just have to wait. There weren't many people in and out of the motel, so when the man parked the latest model Acura, visited the office, and then entered the room on the first floor, he seemed vaguely familiar to David. The name didn't come to mind, but David thought he had seen the man before. All of David's doubts ceased, as did his hopes. About five minutes later, when Lauren's Honda Accord parked next to the Acura, and she jumped out with her purse in her hand, walked to the door of the same room and knocked quickly. A few seconds later, a man opened the door, and Lauren stepped inside with her usual ease and confidence. To hell with my life, it's all true, David thought, pounding his fists on the steering wheel. How could Lauren do this to us? And why? It just didn't make any sense or reason. David had never felt so blind in his life. The planner and organizer had just pulled the rug out from under him. David's thoughts darted left, right, up and down like the new Fury roller coaster at Carowinds, and he suddenly realized that he was now sharing a crumbling stake in a marriage in complete and utter crisis. The knowledge that today was at least the second time Lauren had cheated on him, and the fact that she ducked work to do it, made David feel that there was nothing more to be gained by hanging around the motel. He wasn't going to confront them by knocking on the door. This could get messy, and he needed time and space to calm down and prepare for whatever his next move might be. His disbelief up to this point had left him woefully unprepared emotionally for his next steps. Then he remembered the pen he'd put in her purse and wrinkled his nose bitterly. Real-time audio, he thought painfully. This is just great. He had the presence of mind to take a few pictures of the two cars parked side by side in front of their love nest, and he took a close-up of the man's car with the license plate on it before slowly turning to leave and get back on the road. He didn't have a destination in mind, but for a while he just drove aimlessly until he almost ran a red light and was almost hit. This one shook him up, so he stopped at a brew pub and drank a beer, trying to gather his thoughts. At first he thought he had just gone from idle suspicion to full awareness, but he realized how little he knew at this point. And he had no idea who this guy was, how long this had been going on, and more importantly, why. As far as he knew, for seven plus years, he and Lauren had been exclusive, engaged, and then married. He had enough evidence to counter, but not enough to know if what Lauren would answer would be true. As much as it pained him to listen to the tape of this afternoon's date, he knew he had to wait to get a pen out of her purse before he would say anything to Lauren. He also knew he couldn't be around a lovesick Lauren if she was in the mood to have sex with him later after his supposed business trip. He'd been pushing her away this week, citing the trip so his ready-made excuse would be gone, and further refusal to have sex with Lauren would likely raise her awareness that something was going wrong. So what to do? I need that pen. Then I need to quickly confirm that there's something on it, and then I could get out of the house and stay for a few days to figure out where I am in all this shit, David sketched out in his mind. With that general plan in mind, David had a sneaky thought. She thinks I'll be arriving later than usual tonight. In order for me to shake her and my lover, I need to call with the news that I'm almost home. 
After finishing his beer and paying the bill, he pulled the car back onto the road and dialed Lauren's cell phone number. He wrote a voicemail message. Hi, honey, great news. The prep work paid off big time and everyone did a great job getting things back on track. So I'm about 30 minutes from Charlotte and traffic isn't too bad. I should be home around my normal time. I hope that scares the shit out of her, you fucking tramp, David said aloud to himself. He headed towards the house and when he arrived, he quickly packed a couple of bags and put them in the trunk of his car. He then sat down and wrote a note to Lauren. Depending on how the night had gone, he wanted to be able to just escape without much confrontation. He didn't know what was on the tape, so he didn't want a full-blown confrontation just yet. Part of his reasoning was also to want to daze her as much as she had dazed him. When David called Lauren, she and her lover Rob were in the final throes of their second copulation that day. Today was their last day together, and thanks to the extra runway provided to them by David's trip, they were making a second round for the first time. They had viewed it as a celebration or a victory dance as well, but now it seemed like a potentially imprudent move. Listening to the voicemail message, she muttered, Shit, I need to move, Rob. It was David saying he was on his way back and would be home around 6 p.m. as usual. Well, at least you got the early warning phone call he promised you, Rob joked back as Lauren hugged him and said goodbye, then quickly ran to the bathroom to take a shower. Routine and habits took over. Rob got dressed and left the room while Lauren showered. He was heading to the gym for his standard workout after intercourse and shower. On the way home, Lauren was more concerned about David's early return home and his happy mood about the project changing for the better. I thought he'd come home late and probably burned out from meetings and travel, but he'll probably want to make love tonight after missing most of the week, she thought, as she turned into their neighborhood. Still a little nervous, she rounded the corner, approached her house, and saw David's car already parked in the driveway. Holy shit, he made good time in Friday's traffic, she muttered aloud as she parked her Accord next to his new Civic. Lauren thought he might want to pounce on her as soon as she got in, and that more time since her illicit afternoon sex might be helpful, she thought perhaps a preemptive offer of a nice celebratory dinner might be a good idea. David was on pins and needles when he heard Lauren's car in the driveway. It would be the first time he would see her since he knew for sure she was a cheating slut. Bags packed and in the car, note prepared. All he needed was a pen to write it down. He sat in the living room to catch Lauren as soon as she arrived. Hi, honey, Lauren exclaimed as she walked in and saw David getting up from his chair. Looks like everything went well. Why don't we go out to eat and celebrate? She asked him as they hugged and kissed each other. That sounds great since I got home early. Why don't you go upstairs and change while I make a reservation somewhere, David suggested. Lauren readily agreed and threw her work bag and purse on the table, then walked up the stairs to the master bedroom. David waited until he heard the shower start and then went to her purse and pulled out a pen. He pressed rewind and then play, heard the beginning of the lover's conversation and quickly turned the pen off. Well, that settles it. Time to get out of here. And David pulled out his note for Lauren and left it on the table next to her bags. Stopping in the doorway, David looked back at their house, sadly realizing that nothing would ever be the same between him and her. Lauren hurried into the shower, focusing on cleaning her body again, and dressed quickly, coming downstairs with her ponytail still damp. She assumed he was probably hungry after the trip and also probably wanted to have sex later. Not seeing him in the living room, she made her way to the kitchen and saw a note lying on the table. Picking it up and starting to read it, she awed, No, God, no, this can't be happening. Lauren, I know about your lover and your affair. I couldn't believe it was true, but your afternoon date at the motel dispelled all doubts. You crushed my soul and I am so sad and angry. I will be gone for a night or two while I try to gather my thoughts, and then I will call you to arrange a time for us to talk. Do not try to contact me or find me. Trust me when I say that I do not want to see you until I am ready. David. David left the house and drove to the hotel. Settling into his room, he ate dinner downstairs, ordered a double scotch on the rocks, and then reluctantly returned to the room to listen to the tape of Lauren's afternoon betrayal of their marriage vows. Settling into a chair by the desk, he turned on the recorder and heard the next sound as Lauren entered the room. Lauren. 
Hi, Rob. I can't believe we're already done with this case, both in appointments and time. I didn't think we'd have at least five meetings so easily, and even within 30 days. Rob. Hi, Lauren. Yeah, I thought it would take longer. We spent a lot more time planning and preparing than we did executing. I guess that's the result of good planning, right? I suppose. I have to say I'm glad it's over. The stress of hiding our affair is taking its toll on me, and I can see why long-term romances usually have a disastrous outcome. Yes, it's the same here. I know my wife has no idea, but I can see how over time it could easily stop. You said David would be out of town until later tonight, right? I was thinking we could have a drink just the two of us tonight to celebrate our success and end on a high, so to speak. Ha ha. That was pretty lame, Rob. I'm kind of in favor of it, but rules are rules, so we're not doing anything new that wasn't on the list. Lauren and Rob undressed, and David heard kisses and soft moans coming from Lauren. David heard the bed creak, and then, my turn. Good. I want this first round to be nice and hard. Oh, that's going to be hard. My wife hasn't been allowed to have sex yet since the baby was born. Your tongue feels great. David listened to all 90 minutes of illicit sex between Lauren and Rob. Two things struck him. First, the sex seemed normal, even routine, and David couldn't imagine why Lauren would risk her marriage for the same thing. Rob used condoms during intercourse, and nothing they did was outlandishly erotic. And secondly, neither of them were degrading or denigrating their spouses at all. David knew the affair was real, they'd met five times, but he still had no idea of the why behind it. Friday night was mostly sleepless for both David and Lauren. Eventually, David gave up and realized there was nothing more to be gleaned from the tape. Deciding to take advantage of the weekend and freedom from work, he texted Lauren. I'll stop by your house at 11 a.m. to talk if that's okay with you. Lauren grabbed her phone when she heard the ping of the incoming message. Yes, please come home. I'm so sorry I hurt you. David paid no attention to Lauren's reply. Arriving just before 11 a.m., David dragged himself to the front door and rang the doorbell. Lauren opened the door. David, you don't have to ring your own doorbell. I didn't feel comfortable just walking in, David replied. Can we sit down at the kitchen table and discuss next steps? Lauren was unhappy with David's business-like demeanor and the way this discussion was progressing. Sitting across the table from each other, Time stood still for a moment, and then David cleared his throat and asked a question that shook Lauren to the core. Do you deny in any meaningful way the facts of what I have learned about your activities with Rob? Lauren wept and thought about David's question and how focused and businesslike he was. This conversation, she thought, was meant to make David realize that nothing she had done had changed her feelings for him, and that she and Rob were having this affair just to prove her co-workers wrong. David only knew about the meaningless sex and nothing about the conversations at Lauren's work that led to Rob and Lauren's plan to prove their friends wrong. David, before we go any further, you must first realize that Rob and I only did this to prove that we could have an affair without anyone finding out. A few months ago, many of us at work were discussing affairs and how they are almost always discovered and the tragic upheaval they cause in marriages. The discussion fell into two camps. Some thought that all affairs beyond a one-night stand were bound to be discovered. Others thought that keeping something more than one one-night stand relationship a secret would require some planning and certainly a fair amount of deception. But it could be done. Rob and I got into the last camp and then talked about what precautions would be necessary. Hold on a second. Are you saying this was just an experiment or a game? Just to see if you could have an affair that would go unnoticed? Yeah, that's basically it. It's just that talking about it has become a game. The hypotheses we laid out over a few lunches just took on a life of their own. And eventually we got pretty detailed and we were convinced we could make it happen. But that was the catch. To truly succeed, it would mean that not a single soul could or would ever know what we had accomplished. Long story short, we decided to put our plan to the test, fully aware that Rob loved his wife as much as I love you, and that this game, if you will, meant nothing as far as our relationship was concerned. It was just sex, and one of our conditions for the test was that it had to last at least 30 days, and we had to meet at least five times. But it was just sex, David. We don't love each other at all, 
We love our spouses. We purposefully didn't do anything sexual that we didn't share with our partners, and it never took anything away from our spouses. What do you mean it never took anything away from me? I used to have a faithful wife, and now she's gone. Yes, I suppose that's true now that you know, but if you had never known it, you would have believed me faithful. In my heart, it was meaningless sex. And during that entire month, if you wanted sex after Rob and I were together, I never turned you down. Nice one, Lauren. Sloppy seconds, no harm done. Now I feel really warm and fuzzy. Look, I know you're hurt, and you must feel terrible about what you heard, and I'm truly sorry for hurting you. But I hope the details I've shared can dispel any doubts about my love for you and erase any thoughts about my feelings for Rob. He's just a co-worker I had sex with, but that's all it was, just sex. No love, no feelings. That's only because you know it's a horrible thing right now. Rob and we were very careful, and we were sure we would never be discovered, and we would never think it would do any damage to our marriages. Okay, so it's a long story to basically admit that you cheated on me for a month, slept with a man other than your husband about five times, and fully intended to keep the affair a secret from me, your husband, for the rest of our lives together. Back to my main question. I assume you are not denying any of the disgusting facts of what I have learned about your activities with Rob. Lauren wilted a little at the repeated direct attack on her excuses. Yes, I suppose the facts are what they are, but the reasons for them should matter. It was just sex, and it wasn't even sex born of attraction to each other. There was no lust between us. We just needed sex to prove we could hide an affair. Sex was meaningless to each of us. David was torn between thinking that Lauren must have swallowed a bottle of stupid pills last month and wondering if she always held such crazy beliefs. I do believe that subtle part of your crap. There doesn't seem to be much passion between the two of you. Exactly, David. There was no passion. It was just sex. I know you're hurt, but I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make it up to you. Wait. That's still bullshit. This whole it was just sex excuse is bullshit, and you should know that very well. We talked about being faithful when we decided to be exclusive. We talked about it at length when we talked about marriage. We dated exclusively for almost a year, and we talked again before I proposed. We specifically promised each other fidelity during pre-wedding counseling and in our damn wedding vows. I don't recall any mention of eloping it was just sex. Lauren saw that arguing with their story was pointless. David, you're right. We did discuss fidelity at length. The point I'm trying to make is that we are on the same page where it matters, meaning our love for each other. I have loved only you for the last seven plus years and never for a second had the slightest feelings for Rob. If playing Yahtzee with Rob five times in one month could have mattered, we would have. It was just sex, but sex was necessary to pull off a secret affair. It was more like it was all the stupid pills' fault, and then David seized on what Lauren had just said. So why didn't you just play Yahtzee? Or should you have just played backgammon? Or just do some other damn thing besides just sex? You clearly said you didn't have to have sex with Rob, and you also said that no other soul would ever know about the affair, so you could have done something else in that hotel room, and it would have looked and smelled like an affair. Mission accomplished, right? to prove that you were capable of having an affair, you didn't actually need to have sex. You still needed to hide your activities from your spouses, so there was some guilt involved. You were leaving work early anyway, so you'd still have to hide it. It really didn't matter with or without sex. Lauren's head tilted to the side as she considered David's challenge, and she felt herself sinking fast and deep. Lauren couldn't think of any other excuse to overcome his assumption. Since no one would ever know, it didn't really matter if Rob and Lauren had sex or not. To win their little unannounced bet, they just needed to play out the affair with all the necessary secrets and hotel meetings. So why was she actually having sex? I don't know, David. I never thought about that aspect of secrecy. We planned a secret affair to see if we could pull it off. Then we decided to test our plan. We were just supposed to go all the way to the end. Lauren. All today you've used the word just to minimize what you've done, like saying just a second or just a little, when in reality what you've done is seriously damaging, and it's the worst thing one of us could do to our marriage. 
The fact that you can't see it yourself is probably worse than you sleeping with another man five times in one month. Hell, it almost feels like you've slept with him all of those five times, so it's no big deal. Well, this is a big deal to me, and at this point we're not getting anywhere, so I'm leaving for now. David left, heading back to the hotel. On Monday, he canceled work and began to mull over Lauren's arguments. He couldn't believe she thought so little of her fidelity that she'd cast it aside to win a phantom bet against co-workers who knew nothing. It was all a game to her. I've had enough, David thought to himself. I could sit here and agonize and try to find some explanation for her actions. But there isn't one. This was not just sex. It was a betrayal of her commitment to him, of her precious vows to keep that commitment to him forever, until death do us part. What ultimately struck David most was that no matter how terrible his final decision had been, he felt surprisingly at ease with it. He felt better than he had at any time since he'd gotten that damn email. Without giving up hope, Lauren readily agreed to another meeting the next day. What is it? Lauren asked, quickly looking through the stack of papers. It's just a divorce, David replied.